Welcome to Brain Nevat. We are delighted to be joined by Harry Chalmers, and we're going to be talking about monogamy and why it's wrong. Harry, do you want to start with a thought experiment? Sure. So a thought experiment that I often find myself coming back to is to imagine two partners in a romantic relationship, but they each have an unusual restriction that they place on the other. And the restriction is, look, if you make any friends, or at least any friends besides me, if you want to consider me your friend or both your friend and your partner, that's fine. But if you make any additional friends, any friends outside of this relationship, then I will refuse to support it. I will withdraw my affection. In fact, I'll go as far as to end the relationship. Now, many people, when they think about this restriction, myself included, find something unsettling about it, something troubling. It just seems wrong for partners to place each other under this restriction on having additional friends. And if we ask, why is it wrong? then I think that the most natural answer is that friendship is an important human good. Friendships enrich our lives in various ways. And when you're in a romantic relationship with someone, surely you should want your partner to have such goods in their life. Or at the very least, you should let your partner be free to pursue goods like that as they see fit. And I think further, this is just a part of love, that the love you have for your partner calls for you to be open to your partner uh, pursuing goods like friendship in their preferred way. And all of that, I think, is more or less straightforward. But where it gets interesting is to note that not just friendship, but also arguably sexual and romantic relationships are an important human good. They also enrich our lives in various ways. Some of these ways are pretty simple, such as simply having a good sexual experience with someone, but also just extending it more broadly to having fun times with someone in general, getting to know each other, getting to learn more about yourself, giving and receiving close emotional support. All of these seem like really valuable things. And so there's the question, if sexual and romantic relationships really are good in these ways, why would you want to restrict your partner from having more of them, as one does in monogamy. If it's wrong to restrict your partner from having additional friends, why is it not likewise wrong to restrict your partner from having additional partners? And there are some who will recognize the force of this kind of thought experiment and will say, uh, yes, I see that this thought experiment presents us with a genuine puzzle, namely, what is the morally relevant difference between friendship restrictions and monogamous restrictions. But the thought goes, uh, there are good answers to be given here. There are in fact morally relevant differences. So people in this camp will sometimes appeal to considerations like raising children. You know, perhaps monogamy provides the best environment for raising children, or perhaps monogamy is needed to deal with jealousy, or perhaps monogamy is just the most practical arrangement given various limitations on our time and energy. Uh, and there are various other ways one could try to defend monogamy. Here, I'm not going to go into them in detail because I imagine we'll probably be talking about them more in a few minutes. But I will just say a crucial feature of my view is that I think that all such defenses of monogamy fail. That is, all attempts to find a morally relevant difference between friendship restrictions and monogamous restrictions, at least all attempts that I've encountered, however plausible they might initially seem, it seems to me that when we look at them more closely, we see that they do not in fact stand up to scrutiny. And in light of that, my view is that just as it's wrong to restrict your partner from having additional friends, it is also wrong to restrict your partner from having additional partners or for an uh, additional way of putting it, we could say that what love calls for, the love that you have for your partner is for you to reject monogamy and be open to letting your partner have additional partners if that's what they wish. So I, I love the argument as the local polyamorist, but I have to play devil's advocate because that's my job. So here's, here's one possible objection. So 
I want to resist the initial premise. So the initial premise is that it would be wrong to disallow your partner other friends. What if you and your partner agree to this? So you have a consensual agreement that they won't seek other friends and neither will you. Have you done anything wrong by honoring that agreement? It seems not. Are you saying that it is wrong to form the agreement? There's a separate question, which is, would it be better not to have the agreement? Not morally better, but maybe enhance certain other values, more love, more friendship, if you don't have such agreements. But surely it's not immoral to have the agreement and then stick to it. Yeah, I think that's a line of objection that many people would be sympathetic to and have a few things to say in response to it. So first on the question of, is it you know immoral, on my view, just to form the agreement or like to form it and then to maintain it? I would actually say it's both. I would say it's an agreement that is immoral to form, but then once it is formed, I think partners morally ought to to disengage from it, to release their partner from any obligation that they've taken them to be under, not to make additional friends. And I realize that can sound like a surprising thought because many people will say, look, if the agreement is consensual, what could be wrong with that? Doesn't consent make any restriction that partners agree to? Okay, isn't consent the be all and end all for permissible restrictions in relationships? So this can be a very tempting thought, but it's a thought that I think we should resist. Consent might well be a necessary condition for a restriction in a relationship to be permissible, but it is not a sufficient condition. And to help motivate that claim, um, there are a few cases where I think the overwhelmingly intuitive judgment is that a given restriction is wrong despite being consensual. Of course, I think the friendship restriction is one such case, but just to give it some independent motivation, um, let's consider uh, a more limited version of the friendship restriction. So imagine that two partners are in a relationship and they each have the restriction that if you make any black friends, then that's it, we're done. I'm ending the relationship. Now you could run the example with any race, of course, here I'll just use black, but it seems to me, and I think many people would agree with this, that there is something deeply problematic about a restriction like that. And if someone says, but it's consensual, it just seems that they've missed the point. They've missed the moral uh, significance of that restriction. Now, of course, in the case of monogamy, what's wrong is slightly different. So the case of the no black friends restriction, what makes it wrong is that it's a racist restriction. What's wrong with monogamy is not that it's racist, but my view is that what's instead wrong with monogamy is simply that it goes against love for one's partner, that love calls for us to be open to our partner having important goods like additional friendships, but also additional sexual and romantic relationships, if that's what they choose. And I think that element, the going against love, is there and that it's wrong, even if the restriction is consensual. So that's an interesting move that I wasn't expecting you to make, that there are certain things that it's wrong to consent to. And I suppose I want to know what else would be wrong to consent to. Strong libertarians are going to take the view that you can have consensual slavery contracts, for example, that someone can say, as long as I agree and have the capacity to be bound to you, then that agreement is that whatever harm I've suffered, it's now sanctified by the agreement. And we can imagine situations where that seems permissible. So when there's a fair exchange, for example, so in other words, I'm a doctor and mother comes to me and she says, look, my child is going to die of this incurable disease or this terrible disease, but you could cure the kid and I have no way of paying you. And I say, if you agree to be my indentured servant, then I'll save your child. The value she gets of her child being saved seems to outstrip the value of being my indentured servant for time immemorial. You might think she wouldn't have made such a contract were it not for the duress upon her. You can imagine someone doing it because they enjoy being a slave. We can imagine in the friend case, for example, that some People get together and they say, it's so important for our friendship that our friendship is of such a special nature that to bring anyone else into it would really soil it. And so we make this pact that we will be best friends and no one else will be part of this. And that you can imagine a complaint when someone says, but you breached the agreement, even if it was bad for us to have entered this agreement, even if it didn't, the agreement didn't yield all the wonderful things we expected to yield, you still broke a promise to me and so you've wronged me by having this additional friend, this uh, secret side friend. 
I wonder if you're sympathetic to those cases. So, yeah, I, I certainly don't want to say that because I hold monogamy is wrong, that therefore it's okay to flout any monogamous restrictions that one has agreed to. So my view is not meant to be you know, condoning cheating. And what I would say is that even though the monogamous restrictions are wrong, the, the proper response to it is not just to go out and cheat. Instead, it's to talk about it with one's partner and see if one can, if the partners can both agree to release each other from the restriction. And yeah, I think that would be a much better way of proceeding. Now, for what you were saying earlier, the case of someone giving themselves over to indentured servitude to save their child, I guess I'm just, if I could just first ask about the dialectical significance, is the thought that if I were to agree that's permissible, that would somehow put pressure on my view that monogamy is not okay? Yeah, it seems like the sacrifice that you make as an indentured slave for eternity is a much bigger sacrifice than not having other lovers or not having other friends. And if you mm -hmm. think that case is permissible, then I think you're bound to accept all the weaker cases. So that's why I've given a very strong case where the sacrifice is great. Of course, there's some return, which is that the child is saved. Um, and I think that's a reason for us to think that it's permissible. But you might argue that there's returns in the other cases that the person who agrees not to have other friends or other lovers presumably is getting something out of the bargain. Or you might think if you struck a bad bargain, it doesn't really matter. As long as you had the awareness when you signed the deal, you're bound. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. I would say that in the case of saving the child, the return there is certainly immense. And it just seems undeniable that yeah, saving your child is a really important benefit. I do think there's something going wrong in the case, at the very least, in the doctor demanding indentured servitude as a return for saving the child. That's just a demand it seems like he should not make. But if we're asking, is it permissible for the, the mom to agree to that in order to save her child, then the, the answer might very well be yes. My intuition is leaning toward yes on that, if that really is the only way. Now, what I think the difference is between a case like that and monogamy is, sure, it's no doubt true that people will say, oh, monogamy gives us all these benefits, and that's why the sacrifice is worth it. Sure, I won't be allowed to pursue other partners. My partner won't be able to, but we've both decided that it's worth it. The difference there is that I think when we look more closely at the proposals for what the benefits are, um, we see that they don't actually hold up, that these are just false beliefs. So I think you might have mentioned specialness uh, when talking about the friendship restriction. Maybe it just makes a a relationship more special if it's exclusive. And that is a thought that many people are very drawn to, but for various reasons, I think it's, it's a thought that just doesn't hold up. It's just the belief is false. And if that's right, and I can certainly say more about it in a moment if you'd like, but if that is true, what I've just said that these various proposed benefits of monogamy are in fact illusory, um, then I would say that the sacrifice involved in being monogamous just turns out to be a needless sacrifice. I think sacrifice certainly can be virtuous when there is a genuine need for it. But when there's not a need for it, it just amounts to something more like masochism. But anyway, I've, I've been going on for a bit, so I'll, I'll pause there if there are any threads that you want to follow up on. Yeah, so I want to pick up on this notion of specialness or exclusivity and try and flesh it out in a way that might make a plausible case that I don't personally believe in, but a plausible case for why monogamy is different structurally to friendship exclusivity. You might say something like, if I'm sleeping with only one person and have love only for one person, that love and the sex I'm having with that person are structurally altered by the mere fact that it's only with that person in a way that friendship exclusivity is not structurally altered. It seems to me like spending a lot of time with a romantic partner would enhance the relationship in ways that, for example, spending a lot of time with a friend might hinder that friendship. There's limits on how much time friends want to spend together generally but not such clear limits on how much romantic time romantic partners want to spend together. So there seem to be structural differences where monogamy might be enhancing the relationship, but exclusivity between friends is either not enhancing it or maybe even damaging it. Yeah, so 
I would say it's not clear to me that there is a structural difference, or at least that it's inherent. I do think it's no doubt true that just as a general matter, people prefer to spend more time with their romantic partners than with their friends. And if we somehow flipped the times and people started spending as much time with their friends as with their romantic partners, then probably a lot of friends, yeah, would find that to be too much. But on the other hand, there are, especially for really close friends who maybe spend a lot of time with each other, or maybe certain partners who might not be able to stand too much of each other. I think that it sometimes can go either way. But a perhaps more important point here is that even if we concede the point about friendship, that yeah, friends are not typically as drawn to spending a lot of time with each other. I think that when we consider other kinds of loving relationships, other than friendship, I think we see that exclusivity does not seem to contribute to the specialness at all there, which raises the question of why it would in romantic relationships. Some examples that I have in mind are parent-child relationships. And say a parent might have multiple children and want to spend naturally a great deal of time with each of those children. And it just doesn't at all seem that having an additional child makes their relationship with the first child less special. It's not like we would ever say, oh, Susie, you know, that my relationship with you is very special, but if it weren't for your little brother, Tommy, what we have would be even more special. Of course, that would be a terrible thing to say, but even more on a more basic level, it would just be so wrongheaded to even think that. And you could draw similar parallels to other kinds of family relationships. And so in, in light of the fact that exclusivity doesn't seem to add any specialness to these other kinds of relationships, it's just not clear to me why we should think that it does in the case of romantic relationships. Can we push that though? So can we push the idea that maybe having multiple children does diminish the specialness of the relationship between the parent and each child? I know traditionally we say that's not the case, but let's push it. Suppose you have 30 children. Will you really have as special a relationship with each child as if you had one child? Okay, yeah, I like this way of pushing the case. Here, I would say a few things. I know at least my intuition, I might not be able to say a great deal to back this up. Um, I would concede the point that you won't be able to spend as much individual time with each child. But it's not clear to me that there is a covariance or a one-to-one -one correlation between how much time one is able to spend with someone and how special the relationship is. Maybe the specialness of a relationship is at least partly independent of how much time you can spend with each other. Um, I, I know in my own experience, I don't have any kids, but the people that I've felt closest to in my life have very often been those that I hardly ever get to see and don't really communicate that often with. But whenever we do start uh, talking with each other, it's as if no time has passed. And so one might wonder, could a similar dynamic hold true, even in a case in which one has you know 30 children? Um, and then the other point is, even if that's mistaken and having a very large number of children would make one no longer able to have quite as special relationship with each child, I certainly want to concede the point that our time and energy are limited. We're not uh, infinite beings. Um, but when it comes to monogamy, we have to remember that monogamy doesn't set the limit at something like 30 and then no more. The limit is one. And so I think that even if we allow that with some very large numbers, we, we get some encroachment on the specialness there. It's just not at all obvious to me that would be the case when we're dealing with a number like two or three or four. So I'm thinking of another case where we think exclusivity might be an important value. So often work contracts will have a no moonlighting clause. The idea is the employer says, I have an interest in you working for me and me alone. Part of that is because you have only so much time available to you and I want you to dedicate that time to me and that it's important as an employer that you focus in that way. And the other one might be to avoid conflicts of interest. So you can imagine that certain kinds of jobs in particular, we really don't want that person taking on other simultaneous jobs. So I work as a lawyer and if I think about the role of a judge, we want that judge to be truly impartial. And so if they were employed by other people at the same time, they could wind up having a conflict. We also want them to dedicate their mind to the task at hand because it's a serious job. And so we can imagine that in the romantic context, there's a similar thing that you want this no moonlighting clause because I want you to devote your time to me because it's a special relationship. And also I'm concerned that if you were to see other people romantically, that a conflict would develop. And I'll give you an example of a conflict that might develop. Let's say the two of us see each other romantically, but neither of us want to have children with each other. 
and then you see someone else and that third person wants a child. So now it's introduced this conflict. Let's say the you and the other person do have a child. And now there's this three-party relationship and there's this child that puts pressure on our relationship. It's now created an additional conflict, which would have been avoided if you'd stuck to the no moonlighting clause. Yeah, I think that's a really good case for putting some pressure on my view. And the no moonlighting clause is, is not a case I had considered before. So I'm going to do some live processing it here. But it does occur to me that in the context of a workplace, especially if it's something like a large corporation making rules that will apply to employees that maybe the people making the rules might not know very well, and they just say, look, it's safer to have this as a general rule. Um, that could be, I think, justified in large part simply because of this distance, because when you're, you don't know someone personally, maybe a very risk averse option like that is the safest thing. In the case of romantic relationships, though, presumably you do know the person much, much better. It's much more personal. And because of that, I think that employing a similarly risk averse rule does seem problematically distrustful of one's partner in a way that it might not just getting this rule from corporate. Um, and so I, I know that in my case, when I just think of what I say to a partner, look, our relationship is very important and I, I want you to avoid conflicts of interest. Um, that's not something I would say to a partner. And, and the reason I wouldn't say it is that it seems to me as if it would be better to trust my partner to make the best decision for them. And if that amounts to, or if that ends up with them making an additional kind of relationship that maybe causes some tension, that's fine. We can talk about that. We could find ways of trying to resolve it. Um, any person I would be willing to be a partner with in the first place, I would have a lot of faith in that we could have that kind of discussion, and reach some kind of acceptable compromise. I think that way of proceeding would be a, a lot better than just at, at the outset, just a blanket rule. On, hey, you can't do this because I'm worried that it will uh, impact us. So I want to ask or just clarify what your claim is your claim that this argument establishes that monogamy is impermissible. Is that the thesis? Yes. Okay. So then it does open up this kind of objection, which is you might have provided a reason for why it why monogamy reduces or it or why there's some impermissibility at, or reasons for thinking that monogamy is impermissible, but there's other reasons for thinking why non-monogamy is impermissible and that we then have to balance them. So one of them, for example, would be STIs, sexually transmitted infections. The idea that monogamy doesn't suffer from this if it's practiced as intended versus non-monogamy is at a greater risk, non-monogamous relationships. And this, by the way, is also a response to your initial argument, uh, or to one of the premises in the argument, because there's a disanalogy between friendships and relationships in that friendships don't involve sex generally. And so they, they don't have this problem of if, as you increase the number of partners in a polycule, you increase the chances of sexually transmitted infections if those partners are not in a closed polycule, if they're in an open polycule. Yeah, I, th I think it opens up other objections to the permissibility of non-monogamy. Yeah, here I'll just start by offering a, a clarification comment, which is that uh, it is true, I, I do view this argument that I'm giving as an argument against monogamy, but I certainly don't want to give the impression that it's a knockdown argument. So it's meant as an inductive argument from analogy, it's saying, look, here we have this apparently problematic restriction on friendship and monogamy seems to share the morally troubling feature. So the question is, does monogamy have good making features enough to justify this? And let's look at the most common proposals for a good making feature. Turns out they all fail. So the evidence suggests that monogamy is moral. Now it does not entail that monogamy is moral, but I think it's just, a, it's meant to make that sort of the reasonable conclusion. And so it, it always will be open to the defender of monogamy to say, look, what about this feature of monogamy that you haven't considered? Might that justify monogamy? That is indeed always a move they can make. Now, in the case that you've described of sexual health, yeah, that, that is an objection that people will put forth to non-monogamy. And if it is successful, then I, I do agree. I, I could certainly see how that would make monogamy morally permissible. There are a few reasons, though, why I 
don't think that it ultimately does succeed. And one of them is that monogamy prohibits a range of behaviors that do not carry any risk of STIs or unwanted pregnancy. And some of these are things like outer course or sexting with someone or even just restrictions on emotional intimacy. None of that will be uh, justified by an appeal to sexual health alone. But also a, a further point I would make there is that partners, it's of course partners don't always uh, practice uh, safe sex methods to the extent that they should, but at the very least they, they can, that these are there are various options for reducing the risk of STIs and unwanted pregnancy. And it just seems that when you're in a relationship, at least with someone you trust, it just seems you know, reasonable to trust them to all those practices, or if you really think that you can't trust them to do that, then I would wonder whether it's worth being in a relationship with them in the first place, if the level of distrust is that high. Now, of course, you could say that even with the safer sex practices, that won't eliminate the risk entirely, and that's true. But then we have to consider that there's risk in everything that we do. Anytime you let someone else drive your partner in their car, there's a risk to your partner and vice versa. And it wouldn't make sense to just put a blanket ban on everything that carries any risk. So ultimately, I don't think that sexual health can provide a very clear, rounded defense of monogamy. So it seems like with regards to the risk, you're right that there's the risk that your partner will suffer from having sex with other people, but they bring that risk home in a way that they don't if they're driving on the back of someone's motorcycle. And so you might think that fine, if my partner wants to expose themselves to death by riding on the back of someone's motorcycle, I could ask them not to, they're a free person. But if they come back with motorcycle shards and I wind up in hospital afterwards, then I've got a complaint. And so you have that's different from the cases you give of exposure to risk in regards to the non-monogamous case, because it's the, the initial partner who suffers that risk. And so I wonder if that disanalogy makes things more difficult. Yeah, I'm not sure if there is ultimately much of a disanalogy there because take the motorcycle case and suppose that your partner does get into a wreck when someone else is driving them. Now, sure, the person most immediately affected by that is your partner, but surely that can bring various harms on you indirectly that you, know, you might have now uh, various obligations to support your partner through their recovery that greatly impacts your sex life for a long time if, if their injuries are severe enough. Maybe that puts you through a great deal of emotional uh, stress. And it, it is true there's not direct physical harm there, but I think when we consider the broader range of harms, it's just, it seems to me that there, there is an indirect risk to oneself, even in that case. So in those cases, don't we think it's viable to say you ought not to do it? So you can imagine you've got the married couple with a bunch of kids and the husband says, I'm going out with my mates and we're going to go ride superbikes. And I might not come back or I might come back with you know, less limbs. The wife can say, you've got obligations to me. You're the breadwinner. You won't be able to feed our kids anymore. I'm going to be penniless. So I'm going to invoke a restriction and say, no, you can't ride on the motorcycle with your friends. And we think that's a permissible thing to ask. And we might think that if the husband exposes himself to that risk, which does have the ramifications for the rest of the family, that he's done something wrong, even if the harm doesn't eventuate because you created a risk or you expose yourself to risk and as you say, indirectly expose them to risk. And so arguably in those cases, if the STI is significant enough, and to be fair, let's put it on the record, a whole bunch of things that used to be a death sentence are no longer death sentences, right? With regards to HIV, people can take PrEP, basically means your chance of getting HIV are close to zero. That a lot of STIs, you can take an antibiotic, you're gonna be fine. But I suppose there's like certain things, I think Hep C, where there's a serious, exposure risk and now you've messed with the other partner in some significant way they're going to carry this lifelong illness that sort of makes their life quite a lot worse and i suppose the question is do we only blame you in the cases where the harm eventuates or do we think that creating the risk of harm is enough of a problem yeah so i'm sympathetic to a lot of what you say here i, I think that the the moral issue can't just turn on whether the harm eventuates that creating a high enough risk uh, could itself be the problem yeah, my view here would not be that um, that there can be no risk high enough to justify restriction. I think that if the risk is great enough, then uh, so sometimes restrictions can be justified. What I would question is whether that's the case with non-monogamous sexual activity more broadly, because we have to remember that 
what monogamy prohibits is not just, oh, you can't go out and have sex with someone who has every known STI and refuses to use protection. It's that you, know, you can't have sex with someone who even is much you know, more responsible than that and does use safer sex practices. And even if for all practical purposes, that there's little to no risk of STIs, uh, monogamy prohibits that too. And so I think that Yes, while it would make perfect sense to restrict one's partner from the very risky kinds of sex, like the one I was just describing, I don't think it makes sense to put a blanket ban on any non-monogamous sexual activity whatsoever. How about this objection? I'm really digging deep. So one one way of arguing is that you can't say that it's that you're obligated to perform an action or a series of actions that it's impossible for you to perform. And one could argue that some people, it is impossible for them to be non-monogamous. It's psychologically impossible. They can't do it. They just, they are not built that way. We had an episode with Raja Halwani where we discussed this question of whether monogamy or non-monogamy is an orientation. And he argues that it's not. But at the very least, it does seem like some people would be dreadfully unhappy in non-monogamous setups. And for that reason, you might say that to to make the claim that it's impermissible for them to be monogamous, and they're then I assume you're trying to say that if they are going to have sexual relationships, that they're obligated for those relationships to be non-monogamous. I assume that's the corollary. That seems too strong, right? It seems like you're forcing them to perform actions that are psychologically impossible for them to perform happily. Yeah. So this gets into another part of my view that I think it's really important that I try to state as clearly as I can, which is that my view is not that people are morally obligated to be in a romantic relationship with more than one person at a time. Or my view is not even the weaker claim that if one is in a romantic relationship, then one is obligated to have it be with multiple partners. It's perfectly fine to have just one partner. So the crucial aspect of my view here is that there's an obligation not to restrict your partner from having additional partners, if that's what they wish. And so in the case of someone who just maybe doesn't particularly want to have multiple partners, someone who's just not interested in it, I would say that's fine. In that case, they're just acting under a preference, not a restriction. But I would say if they let their partner open to be having open to having multiple partners, then it also seems to me that their relationship is properly classified as non-monogamous, even if they themselves just have one partner. Yeah, it does seem like you could have a society where uh, all relationships are, let's say, de jure in law, non-monogamous, but de facto monogamous. So everybody says you always have the right to go and see whoever you like, but in practice, we never do it. And that would satisfy your conditions. I imagine that you might want to go a little bit further, which is that there's something praiseworthy about being non-monogamous, that it opens up more of life's pressures in the same way that if you just constrain yourself to having one friend, you'd be living a stunted life. You might think that you've missed out on the importance of being exposed to other people, that if you only read one author, for example, you might think that you led a stunted existence. And so tying yourself to one romantic partner might be doing the same thing, might be the kind of uh, thing we think of as vicious in a way that you've limited yourself. So I wonder if you can give us a, an extent of non-monogamy gives us some idea of what you mean. It just means things that are non-monogamous, but what are the different ways in which people can be non-monogamous and why could those things be better than monogamy? Yeah, there are various forms of non-monogamy. There are, for example, open relationships where there's an openness to sexual interaction between one's partner and others, but not really that same openness to emotionally intimate relationships. And so that's certainly less restrictive than monogamy, but not as it's more restrictive than something like polyamory, in which there would be openness to sexual and romantic relationships, extra dyadic sexual and romantic relationships, both for oneself and one's partner. And my view is that uh, to the extent that there are any restrictions in a relationship at all, um, there must be a good reason for them. There needs to be a good reason. If there's not a good reason, then the restrictions are immoral. And in the case of open relationships, I think open relationships are easier to defend than monogamy, but I will admit that it's hard for me to think of a good justification for restricting 
your partner from having additional sexual relationships. I think if you're already allowing them to have, or sorry, additional emotional, the intimate relationships. I think if you're already allowing them to have relationships on the side, then it just seems to me that it would make more sense to allow emotionally intimate relationships as well. Um, and so the form of non-monogamy that I think would be ethically the best would just be full-blown polyamory. It's not to say that there, there couldn't be any restrictions against particular people. If there's someone who's really dangerous, then it would be fine to restrict your partner from starting a relationship with that person. But I think that's consistent with polyamory itself, which is just that um, there are no restrictions in principle on having multiple sexual and emotionally intimate relationships. So it's a real breath of fresh air on this show to be told that I'm doing the right thing because Mark constantly tells me I'm doing the wrong <laughs> things, that I have the right setup. I want to return though to my uh, initial points or my previous objections. So my previous objection was not that it would be very difficult for someone to sleep with multiple people, but it's very difficult for them to conceive of the idea that their partner is open to doing so. So in that case, even if you've got the society Mark's talking about where You've got a whole bunch of people in monogamous relationships in the way they act, but not in the restrictions that they've agreed upon. So at any time they can sleep with other people, they just choose not to. That's even that type of setup would be very difficult for certain people. They would say, yes, I know that in practice you don't sleep with other people, but it really bothers me that at any moment the hammer could fall and you do sleep with other people it's psychologically impossible for me to be in such a relationship and be happy at the same time. So how can you say that it's obligatory that, that I have to allow you to do that if I'm going to be in a relationship with you? Okay. So thank you for that clarification. And yeah, that does help me understand uh, your, your earlier objection. Just to clarify a bit further, th this is someone who's really susceptible to jealousy, it sounds like. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't understand it fully because I'm not that kind of person. But but friends of mine who are monogamous and very happy in their marriages have explained to me that they would just be deeply unhappy in such a setup. And I take their proclamations at face value. I, I agree that for whatever reason, whether it's jealousy based or perhaps the jealousy intimates at some deeper need for security and exclusivity that 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 satisfies them in some way that a, a polyamorous or open relationship would not, that certain people are just not built for this. And I'm even open to the idea that it's the majority of people would be deeply unhappy in an open or polyamorous setup. I, I trust people when they say to me, I just couldn't do that. All right. I think there are a few things to be said here when it comes to worries about things like jealousy or insecurity, or just not being able to be happy in a non-monogamous setup. And the first thing that I would like to say is that people who are going through these feelings certainly deserve, that as those who are you know, caught in the throes of jealousy, for example, it's an awful thing to feel and they certainly deserve our sympathy and compassion. And I think that in large part because of how difficult it is to feel these kinds of feelings that you were describing, I think we need to ask whether monogamy is really the best solution now, at first glance, it can seem like monogamy is the best or perhaps even the only solution, the only way of preventing people from feeling this way. But I think when we look at it more closely, we see that monogamy is in fact quite counterproductive as a solution to worries about jealousy and insecurity. And here's how. When you're in a monogamous relationship with someone, since you're not allowing your partner to have any additional partners, one upshot of that is that you've effectively forced your partner to choose between you and others. And what that means in practice is that the more desirable other people seem, the more your partner is going to have a reason to leave you for them, since your partner can't choose both. And so I think that by creating this element of scarcity and competition in relationships, monogamy is actually a large part of what perpetuates jealousy. And that if we, we didn't have this element of scarcity and competition, people might not have so much fear of their partner leaving them for someone else. And so what I would say about when it comes to monogamy and in relation to jealousy and insecurity, um, I don't think monogamy really deals with, I don't think it addresses jealousy. I think it just capitulates to it. 
So anytime there's someone feeling jealous, rather than having monogamy really confront the underlying problems or needs, and I think any case of jealousy does uh, suggest some underlying problem or need that is calling out to be addressed. But monogamy does not address it. Instead, monogamy just tries to prevent behaviors that trigger jealous feelings. And it does that in, in a very counterproductive way, as, as I've just described. And so what I think a better solution to this kind of thing would be giving up monogamy and then doing certain kinds of emotional work on oneself to overcome the disposition to be jealous in the first place, or at the very least to reach a state where whenever one does become jealous, one will have uh, healthy, effective techniques for working through it, reducing it to a manageable level. And there are various ways one can do that. Some of them are cognitive, a matter of just changing one's thinking, one's assumptions. Others are less, and I'd be happy to talk about that in more detail if you'd like. There's a lot to be said about it, but I, I just, as a broad level picture of my view here, I think it makes a lot more sense to, to work on and overcome the disposition toward jealousy rather than trying to structure one's relationships to avoid it. I really like the answer. I really like this claim that monogamy doesn't solve the problem. I think it's quite a novel claim and very well taken. Can you speak a bit more about the ways that jealousy can be overcome? Because I think that is probably the primary objection in a lot of monogamous people's minds, the idea that jealousy cannot be overcome and should we shouldn't have to. Yeah, and I think that's an entirely fair claim to make. And also, for whatever it's worth, I think it's the best objection. This is the one that is the hardest, I think, for my view. And so it's worth, I think, really delving into it and seeing what can be said in response. So when it comes to overcoming the disposition toward jealousy in the first place, I think that a lot of it does have to do with our cognition. I think that our emotions, our feelings are deeply intertwined with the way we think. And that this is one of the insights of things like cognitive behavioral therapy. And so in the case of jealousy, uh, some of the assumptions that many people have, some of the ways of thinking make jealousy much more probable and also make it much more intense. And one of those assumptions, one of those ways of thinking is that if my partner becomes interested in someone else, that means there's something wrong with our relationship. It means I'm not enough for them means they're not satisfied with me. And I think people don't usually put the thought that explicitly. It's something they just take for granted because monogamy is so deeply a part of our culture that people just think in terms of this framework. But I think if we ask, um, is that thought actually true? You know, does it suggest that your partner is not happy with you if they become interested in someone else? Um, I think the answer is no, it's, it's clearly not. That the only way it would be is if we have this view of relationships as driven by a need to correct for deficiency. So the idea would be, the framework would be, uh, I'm not enough on my own. I need a partner to correct for the things that are wrong with me, to uh, offset whatever deficiencies I have. And if my partner is doing that, then I should be perfectly satisfied. I should not see any value in additional relationships and vice versa for my partner in relation to me. Uh, so if my partner ends up becoming interested in someone else or seeing someone else, that means that there's some portion of the deficiency in them that I've failed to correct. And that just, it reflects badly on our relationship. But I think that's just a terrible way of thinking about the value and purpose of relationships. And that the reason why we form relationships with others is not, or at least should not be to correct for some deficiency in ourselves. It should be because relationships are a source of value in our lives. They make our lives better in various ways. And there's just no tension at all between having a perfectly fulfilling, perfectly satisfying relationship with your partner and also acknowledging that additional relationships could bring in additional value. And this would be thinking of it much like friendship or much like parent-child relationships or really just about any other kind of relationship where if, if a friend makes an additional friend, no one thinks that suggests that the first friend wasn't enough like it would just seem so sadly neurotic to us if a friend did think that way. And so I think that's one of the psychological hurdles. And, and I think people who say, oh, I just couldn't uh, get past jealousy. It seems likely to me that they've internalized beliefs like that. And that if, if they were to challenge thoughts like these, it wouldn't guarantee that the jealousy would go away, but I do think it would substantially reduce it. 
Um, so I, I know I've been talking for a bit. Um, I'll, I'll just try to say one more, one more change or one more sort of strategy to to bring in when um, dealing with jealousy is to think about the fear of losing your partner to someone else. Now, as I was saying earlier, I think monogamy is a large part of what makes this fear rational because you've forced your partner to choose between you and others. Under a monogamous framework, it would make sense why you might worry about, hey, if that other guy's too attractive, maybe my partner is going to think about you know, getting with him instead of me. But once one has abandoned monogamy, there's the question, uh, is it rational to have so much fear of your partner leaving you for someone else? Uh, if your relationship with them is mutually fulfilling, uh, shouldn't you trust your partner to want to stay with you? And even if they did decide to leave, if they decided that was best for them, isn't that something that you should be open to as part of just wanting the best for them, part of your love for them, wanting them to choose what's best for them? And so I, I think that through various, and, and that's not even getting into um, ways of addressing the more visceral, more physical sensations of jealousy. Some people will say, oh, it just strikes me as a pain in my chest, even independently of what I'm thinking. I do think there are effective ways of addressing that side of it, such as breath control, meditation. Uh, also, some of them can involve one's partner, getting encouragement from your partner, talking with your partner about your feelings, journaling, and things like that. And through all of these ways, and also just recognizing that you are enough by yourself, you do not need your partner for your life to be meaningful, for your life to be fulfilling, overcoming that dependency, that emotional dependency on your partner, I think is absolutely crucial here. And to the extent that people really do uh, work on that area of it, then I think they will find that even if jealousy is not completely eliminated, it will at least be to the point where it's manageable. It's a challenge that can be constructively confronted, can be managed in that way, just like any other challenge that arises in a relationship. So I think what's interesting about people being able to change their preferences is that I think for a long time, the idea of monogamy is really inherited from the stories of the couples that you see in your life, that it felt like a completely abnormal thing. And now we're starting to see polyamory being spoken about much more regularly, that there's depictions of it in film and in television. And so that might play a role in shifting people's preferences. I had a friend, I had the discussion with her on three occasions. The first time she said, that's disgusting and immoral. The second time she said, I, I can see that it's not immoral, but it's not for me. And the third time was, this is my second boyfriend. So <laughs> people's, <laughs> people's minds change. I, I wonder about this objection, which is that maybe uh, monogamy in comparison to certain forms of non-monogamy might have certain social benefits. So it's not that the individuals have done anything wrong through the one life choice or the other. It's that the accumulative choices have a certain negative effect. Let's imagine that you have a non-monogamous society where men take on multiple female partners and women don't do that. South Africa has traditionally been one of these societies where polygamy is legal under African customary law. And one of the arguments against the practice is that what you wind up with is a scarcity of single females and an abundance of single males. And the difficulty with having an abundance of single males in a society is that they are more likely to act out in violent ways that in the early days of the Mormon church, you had practices of men taking on uh, many wives, and uh, you then had these sort of battles where either the young men were exiled to remove them as threats, or that they would go and, and kill the older men so that there were more single women available. And that seems like a bad thing. Uh, it seems like you could have some reverse scenario of that, where let's say, women took on many male partners and that you then had a lack of males and that could have some other kind of negative social effect. Maybe what you have is that you have an abundance of spinsters who then feel resentful. It could be, of course, that there's a version of this where everybody sees everybody and that everybody who's sufficiently non-monogamous and that there's no exclusivity at all just has an abundance of choice all the time because no one is ever removed from the pool. And so that seems to solve the problem. My I suppose my objection relates to a certain form of non-monogamy, which causes these social difficulties. And I wonder if you think, given that possibility that monogamy then not causing that becomes permissible. Yeah, I think this is one of the objections that is fairly recent in the literature. And I think that it's 
a lot of philosophers miss it or, or don't really think about it, but I do think it, it deserves more attention than it usually gets. And I have a few things to say in response to it. Um, I'll just frame it in terms of a worry that if people in general are non-monogamous, then the few men at the top might have many female partners and the many more men at the bottom, because that's the way it's usually framed. And so I think that the first point to make here is to note that the way the objection works is, is by proposing that if people are monogamous, then that reduces intrasexual competition among men. In that if everyone's monogamous, then the few men at the top, instead of each having a harem, they're each just going to have one woman. And then the women who would otherwise be in their harem go out and now they're with the men who might not otherwise have a chance. So that's the scenario that asks us to imagine. But I think there is room to doubt that things actually would shake out that way. Um, that, that is that monogamy really does reduce intrasexual competition among men. And one reason I say that is that a great deal of the intrasexual competition among men is expressed in sentiments like, oh, everyone around me is already taken, or you know, all of the good ones are taken. I just can't find anyone. And that's a sentiment, of course, that makes sense only under a monogamous uh, backdrop. Because if people in general reject monogamy, then for someone to already be in a relationship is not necessarily any obstacle to your being in a relationship with them. And so I think in this way, if, if people were to give up monogamy, it might actually, in a significant sense, reduce intrasexual competition among men because we wouldn't have this element of, oh, the other men succeeded, they found someone, the, the women that are with them are taken, and now those, those women are closed off to me. A second point I would make is that I do think that something like this objection might very well have made sense uh, in fairly distant perhaps history or considering certain ancient, very patriarchal societies where women had very little economic or social power and where the best prospect for survival for a woman and any children she had was to get with a rich, high-status man. And also where there was no contraception, no genetic testing. And so the only way for men who wanted to ensure paternity was to enforce chastity in their wives. Uh, it makes sense what, how in an environment like that, the natural result would be harems for the few men at the top and the, the vastly more men at the bottom would not have anyone. But I think it's also fair to say that just does not seem like the kind of world that we live in anymore, at least not in you know, developed countries, developed societies. Women have a great deal more economic and social power now than then. And so if, if people in general now were to give up monogamy, I just don't think it's very realistic to think that women would all flock to be part of Chad's harem. I think that in general, women want at least want a committed, serious relationship with at least one person. Now, not necessarily an exclusive relationship, but at least a, a committed, serious relationship uh, with at least one person. And having that is going to require branching out a bit beyond Chad. And so I think that that's a further reason why I'm a bit skeptical of this objection. And then one last point, and this is the, the final thing I'll say, so I don't go on too long, but even if what I've just said is wrong, and in fact, non-monogamy does have certain negative externalities in the form of reproducing a, a mating pattern that favors the relatively few men who are very rich, very high status, and leading to lots of, lots of incels, basically, there's the question or, or there's the point that it just seems to me that for the individual or for the couple who's deciding whether to be monogamous, that is such a distant abstract consideration compared to the consideration that I like to focus on about monogamy, which is that monogamy seems less consonant with love for your partner than non-monogamy. Like to me, that seems like a much more pressing, much more concrete ethical consideration. And so I think even if we were to be maximally concessive to this objection, I just don't think it would have the force needed to justify monogamy for the individual or for the couple who's deciding whether to be monogamous. I think that the most it could do perhaps is that maybe it could justify the leaders of society and structuring society in such a way that people are more likely to choose monogamy. But again, I think that's really the most this objection could do. So Jason alluded earlier to the idea that 
monogamy and non-monogamy could be different kinds of sexual orientations in the same way that being gay or straight orientations. Do you think there's anything in that view in the sense that it's it's a very strongly held preference that you have? Maybe you're born that way or maybe you become that way, but it's a strong preference that you don't really want to deviate from. And then secondly, I wonder if being polyamorous is compatible with other orientations. So you have people who will describe themselves as being asexual, aromantic, and polyamorous. And I wonder if that makes sense. When you say to them, it sounds like you have a lot of friends, they get very offended. They say, no, 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 I'm polyamorous. I'm just not romantically attracted to any of these people that are in my polycule and I don't want to have sex with any of them. Okay, yeah. So I'll take those two in order and first consider the question of whether monogamy and non-monogamy could be orientations. And I can see the threat to my view here, which is that if it does turn out to be an orientation, then that makes it more difficult to argue that it's moral to be monogamous. Uh, because it's, do people really have a choice over their orientations? It seems like they don't. Um, I will just say one difference between monogamy and sexual orientations, being gay or being straight, is that if you ask someone why they're gay or why they're straight or why they're bisexual, what have you, it doesn't really seem that there's much one can do in terms of giving reasons. Like I know if someone asked me why you're straight, I would just say, uh, I don't know, I can't really tell you. It's just something that's always been a part of me. But by contrast, if you ask someone why they're monogamous or why they're non-monogamous, I think it's relatively rare to find someone who will say, oh, no reason, I can't tell you. Very often they'll say, oh, it's because monogamy gives the best environment for raising children. Or, oh, it's because if I weren't monogamous, I would feel really jealous. Or, oh, monogamy just seems more practical given limited time and energy. And given that we have all of these sort of reason giving practices when it comes to monogamy and non-monogamy, it seems to me like it's less an orientation and more a choice based on values that people have and, and beliefs that people have. And then the second question you raised was about, I might have forgotten some of it, but if someone can be polyamorous and asexual or, um, yeah, I suppose I don't see any reason why they couldn't. It could just be that maybe they have multiple emotionally intimate relationships going on at a time and they're fine with their partners having multiple sexual or emotionally intimate relationships. Maybe this person who's asexual just doesn't have sex with anyone. And yeah, I think that's compatible with their being polyamorous.